In this series of conversations, we'll be discussing global food sustainability with guests who bring a deep understanding of the environmental and cultural challenges facing our society and creative ideas on how to address them. I'm Ash Sweeting. Today we are joined by Richard Eckhart from the University of Melbourne. Richard focuses on carbon accounting and the analysis of mitigation strategies to reduce agricultural greenhouse emissions. Look, there's a very strong drive towards um, carbon neutrality. And I think um, governments are playing games with discussing whether they should or shouldn't set targets. But that train left the station after the Paris Agreement. If, you, if you're a farmer currently on the land um, wanting to do something, there are the 10 to 15% reduction in methane options you've got just through herd efficiency, so we're seeing farmers access premium markets on carbon neutrality alone without trading offsets, just demonstrating carbon neutrality. And the market hasn't wised up that they should be paying more for methane reduction credits than soil carbon credits. Current technologies have their limitations. As you would well know, if it's an inhibitor product, it's got to be at every microsite in the room and at every second of the day to have maximum efficacy. Researchers are continuing to improve their understanding of the rumen microbiome. Which gives us hope that you can actually use certain products to, to rearrange the microbial composition of the rumen. Climate change is a global issue and opportunities, and the analysis of climate impacts looks different through this global lens. What if we treated all the sheep in East Africa for worms? How much methane would you save? And it's actually a massive number. And there's a great analysis that actually showed that if you take the emissions per liter of milk and you divide it, the emissions between all the multifunctionality, the emissions per liter of milk from a dairy cow in East Africa is far lower than the most efficient Californian dairy or the most efficient um, Australian dairy. Likewise, he provides an alternative angle on the challenges involved in scaling alternative proteins. The, the proportion of the world's population that have the privilege of diet choice is less than about 8% of the world's population. So, Richard, awesome. Thank you very much for joining me. Thanks, Ash. Um, yeah, look, I'm, I'm, I'm a professor at the University of Melbourne in the School of Ag and Food, Agriculture and Food, and I lead a centre, a research centre called the Primary Industries Climate Challenges Centre. Um, and... Uh, our work um, mainly focuses on all aspects of how climate change will affect agriculture or agriculture affects climate change. So we do a lot of work in, um, in uh, elevated CO2 on effects on crop growth. We do work on extreme climate events and how they might affect agriculture. But my particular focus within the centre has been on carbon accounting, carbon neutral agriculture and mitigation strategies or the analysis of mitigation strategies that are viable to get us towards a lower emissions footprint for the agriculture sector. Um, so that's most of the work I do. So a lot of the work I do sits between the summation of all the research available and flowing through to how policy can then take that forward or voluntary carbon markets can take it forward or how the national inventory can adopt that method into their calculations um, and how we can then communicate that back out to farmers. So I spend a fair bit of time in that interface speaking both with the farming community and with the policy community. Just a bit on how you got to, you know, your history, how you got to where you are at the moment. I started working in sort of the rangeland systems of Africa. You can probably tell from the accent. Um, and um, so, so worked a fair bit in, in that sort of rangeland ecology, um, but also in, in nutrient cycling in grazing systems. Um, that sort of led on to, um, and, and my undergraduate was in the biochemistry of ruminant nutrition, and then a master's degree in soil nutrition and a PhD in grazing systems. Um, so I kind of ended up in a situation where I was working on the nitrogen cycle and intensive grazing systems and started seeing that a lot of the nitrogen is being lost as gases and what can we do about that? But then when the area of climate change, about 20 years ago, the area of climate change and, and greenhouse gas emissions really became a, a, a sort of more prominent issue. Um, those sort of undergraduate skills all came to play because I knew enough about 
uh, ruminant nutrition to start up projects in enteric methane loss. So you see, I've done a fair bit of work on dietary supplementation to reduce methane. Um, so all, all that biochemistry of ruminant and nutrition was really essential. I've published a fair bit of work on nitrous oxide emissions and nitrogen cycling in agriculture because I had all that soil science background in the soil nitrogen cycle. And more recently, what's really come to the fore is soil organic matter, soil carbon as part of the picture. And so again, all that background in soil science leading to nutrient cycling has played a role. So I found myself in a fairly unique position of being able to do more that collective systems analysis um, because of the understanding of all aspects of the system, the points of influence. And so right now, um, because the Australian government took a sort of less investment in the methane side of the equation, most of my methane work is actually now being done in Central Africa with the International Livestock Research Institute. Um, they've got the same methane chambers as we used to have, we do have in Australia. Um, and um, so, so I do work on beef cattle and legume, tropical legumes in East Africa. So that's awesome that you've got that, um, that crossover between the, the soil, the, the room and microbiome and the grazing systems and the, and the nutrient cycling. From the research you're doing, where do you see the, um, the greatest hope or the greatest opportunities to, to change? If, you, if you're a farmer currently on the land um, wanting to do something, there are the 10 to 15% reduction in methane options you've got just through herd efficiency, through uh, weaning percentages, through maybe bringing legumes back into your system. Those are the sort of do now things, but what's really transitioning is the opportunity to dramatically reduce methane through supplementation. So we've done work on oils and tannins, which gets you sort of to your 20% reduction in methane. But there are other products coming on the market, which we know about that, that are, are, are market ready, that scale up to sort of the 50% up to, and some of the more recent products that we're seeing coming through that can get up to the 80%. The big opportunity, I think, is then how do we deliver those products into the extensive grazing industries? Um, because what we've currently got is you know, you've got your products from DSM Nutrition, you've got your seaweed that, that are claiming the sort of 80%. But in any inhibitor product that you've got, uh, as you would well know, if it's an inhibitor product, it's got to be at every microsite in the room and at every second of the day to have maximum efficacy. So in theory, in the laboratory and in the vitro system, you'll get sort of 95% reduction in methane or inhibition of methane. But the moment you scale that through to the grazing industries where you're only putting in once a day or once every couple of days, therein lies the challenge because your efficacy just crashes. Um, and so some form of slow release mechanism, a bolus, a slow release capsule is going to be essential to deliver these active ingredients at a more consistent rate in the room. Um, so, so that I see is the, the sort of big opportunity. A generation from now, I would see that we might actually only be using some of these inhibitors in the confinement industries, but in the extensive grazing industries, we might be using a product, an inhibitor, to train the next generation to be low methane. So there's a very good publication in, in this journal Science that came out by an author named, uh, uh, surname Mealy, um, that showed that you could use a product like 3NOP to feed to the cows and calves and for three weeks through the weaning phase, and then the animals remain 20%, 30% less methane for the next 50 days, um, which gives us hope that you can actually use certain products to, to rearrange the microbial composition of the rumen. And, and that goes back to some of the, it's called early life programming, and it goes back to sort of human nutrition, which suggests that your and my gut microflora are a product of our upbringing. And it is the same for ruminants. And there is an angle there, um, and it comes into mitigation strategies as well, is that a lot of the microbes in the rumen can re-adjust uh, their populations very rapidly. So if you get acidosis, for example, um, once, as soon as that's over, within hours, you've got the microbes readjusting back to normal populations. Methanogens tend to take three to four days to get back to numbers. And so therein lies the potential for a strategy as well that actually you might, some strategies that 
crash their population might not need to be fed every day. Um, inhibitors do, because they don't actually get rid of methanogens. But if you had something like an oil that does actually suppress methanogen numbers or a tannin or uh, essential oils, um, you can actually drop their numbers and they take a longer time to recover. So there's an opportunity in that gap as well. Um, one of the things that um, I guess a lot of this comes from um, speaking with the uh, Professor Athel Cleave, um, UQ, DAFQ, and his work across species that the, and you'd know more about this than I do, but the, the process of um, biological um, metabolic processes that leads to methane production, it's, it's quite a cascade of events. So the first thing you need to do is whatever the reactions are that lead to the free hydrogen. And it's only when the methanogens have that substrate of free hydrogen that they can mop up that free hydrogen, free hydrogen and turn it into methane. So from my view, looking at that, um, because you have a whole suite of different processes going on, there would be a whole suite of different areas, a whole range of different areas where you can in intervene. Um, and if you can stop the hydrogen production or reduce that, then you're going to naturally reduce the, the methane production and you'll have the added benefit of the energy retaining being retained in the animal rather than being lost to the environment. Where, where do you see that approach? Is Look, I, I think that's, that's fairly well understood. Um, you know, you, you're right. The, these inhibitors, the, the, the inhibitors that are known to inhibit the last stage in the methanogenesis cycle, uh, uh, methanogenesis process, they, they, they weigh down that list. They're the sort of last step. Um, and so it's probably not surprising we, we don't see a large productivity benefit in the animal from those, um, which, which, is, which is fine. I mean, they're doing their job. But, but a lot of the earlier strategies were focused on, can we simply redirect hydrogen from butyrate to propionate, for example? Um, and, and so some of the nutritional strategies were focused on just getting more propionate in the room, and, and that, just take, that absorbs two hydrogens, whereas butyrate uh, produces two hydrogens. So, you know, inherently more propionate is going to rob hydrogen from methane production. Um, and that's where strategies like nitrates and sulfates came in because they mole for mole nitrate in the rumen would take the four hydrogens that would have gone to, um, uh, to, prop to, um, to methane. Um, but then you step it up and you say, well, some of the, some of the grain supplementation ideas were actually just stimulating propionate production. And some of the um, some of the other nutritional strategies, um, we think uh, a grape mark, for example, some of the work we did there showed a distinct bias towards propionate. We don't quite understand why, but um, you know it might have been some of the sugars that are being added that act stimulate propionate over butyrate. But I, I think there is still great opportunity to to manipulate the volatile fatty acid compositions as a mechanism of just. Um, redirecting hydrogen into more productive purposes. And, and that's where we see some of the productivity gains in the animal as well, because it's sometimes what we found is if you just do a calculation of we can reduce methane by 50%, but that's only 6 to 10% of gross energy intake. So if you boil that back and you say, well, we've done 50%, well, we've saved 3 to 5% of gross energy intake. I don't think we can measure that in terms of increased production because it's just such a small part of the energy equation. But some of these strategies actually work and produce more productivity than a three to five percent gross energy savings would indicate. And what that tells me is they are stimulating propionate production over some of the less advantageous volatile fatty acids. And so you're getting more to use an Australian slang, bang for your buck as a result. <laughs> um, thank you very much. I think that's um, very well explained. Um, where do you see or do you see, and if so, where uh, opportunities for, I guess, what's what you could call next generation technologies, um, better understanding of the epigenome within cells, how to switch on and switch off genes or um, various forms of you know, mRNA technology like was developed for COVID vaccine, um, 
I guess genomics and and using AI for for genomic and gene analysis. Where do you see that kind of or where if and where do you see that technology fitting into this? Yeah, look, there, there, there's no doubt there's, there's been a lot of research in this area, particularly the New Zealand group have done well in, in understanding the, uh, the genetic uh, code of, of methanogens. Um, you know, and they, they've done a lot of work on the methane vaccine, which I think is has been promising, but has some limitations to it, just in terms of the delivery mechanism um, might be limita limiting. But all of that work is actually allowed us to identify sort of common attributes of all methanogens, for example. Um, like the early vaccine work was more of a shotgun approach. We didn't understand why it would work. Whereas now the understanding is, are there common surface proteins we can target? Um, and so that sort of opens the door, you know, it's a similar conversation to what you've heard in the COVID land um, about common, common spike proteins. And we now know there's common surface proteins in methanogens that could be exploited for a targeted vaccine. Um, and uh, I suspect the mRNA technology is coming along just at about the right time for that team to start exploring, can we target a, um, a, just that surface protein so that we know that when we add a vaccine into the rumen, um, we, we cover all methanogens rather than just, because some of the early work might have targeted the dominant species of methanogens, Brevibacter and some of those. Um, but but what, what, in terms of energetics in the room and what might end up happening is you just suppress that dominant population and give a gap for the second hierarchy of, of energy to, to exploit the gap. Um, you know, the idea that suppressing all methanogens will allow cetogens to predominate, well, I think Athol showed us that wasn't going to happen because the energy difference is just too much. Whereas if you just suppress the dominant methanogen populations and don't suppress them all, you're going to get the expression of some of the, the slightly less dominant, but still energetically favorable methanogens. So I, I think there's, there's, there's quite a lot of potential there in the first instance, targeting vaccine technology, um, the, which, which, you know, at the moment, the choke point I think is in the delivery through saliva. Um, I, I think they're just, in, in theory, it can be very effective, but in practice, you've got to result, you've got to let the saliva build up the right tighter levels so that you've got enough antibodies going into the rumen. Um, and that could be the actual choke point, whereas um, a more targeted um, delivery directly into the rumen through supplementation might actually be more effective in the end. Uh, thank you for that. Um, in some ways, I guess we've, we've covered, you said, earlier that you're you're at the cross section of the farming community the science and policy and i think we've um in some ways covered the easy stuff the technical the science because you know that's the science that's how it is that's how it works um and in in my experience it's frequently the the technical solutions that are the most straightforward and most simple and it becomes more complicated when people and communities and, and governments and everyone else and cultures come in. How do you see that landscape, um, I guess, both from within within the Australian contents but also more globally? Look, it, there's, there's a very strong drive towards um, carbon neutrality and I think um, governments are playing games with discussing whether they should or shouldn't set targets, but that train left the station after the Paris Agreement. Uh, what, what we know is that after the Paris Climate Agreement, a lot of the multinational agribusiness companies, supply chain companies, have all set targets that are consistent with the Paris Agreement. And, and you think of Australia, 70% of our produce is exported. Um, so actually, governments debating targets for agriculture becomes an irrelevant discussion. They, they make themselves dinosaurs by having that discussion. Because we in agriculture in Australia need to understand what the supply chain is, is saying to us. And, if this, if, and so you can see this cascade, for example, Unilever set a target consistent with the Paris Climate Agreement. Straight after that, Fonterra supplies most of the dairy products to Unilever. Fonterra had to match Unilever's target because, well, by 2030, they won't be able to supply Unilever um, and Unilever will be seeking other markets if Fonterra doesn't respond. So that cascades onto all the dairy farmers of New Zealand who now understand that Fonterra has set a greenhouse emission reduction target. 
So we, we've seen quite a response in the farming community. You'd be aware the Australian red meat industry set a target of carbon neutrality by 2030. Very ambitious target, but that's galvanized a lot of action. So I, I host most of the carbon accounting tools that are used in Australia. And we've currently got a project with 100 producers, grain producers in Western Australia completing their carbon audits. We've got over 400 red meat producers on the eastern seaboard that have done carbon audits on their property using our tools. We've got the wine industry, the poultry industry, and even yesterday, the pig industry and the goat industry have been approaching us about carbon audits. So everyone's centering in on, we've got to be aware of what our footprint is and what we can do about it. But then you start seeing those farmers that are innovative and they see the opportunity. So I was talking to a bunch of dairy farmers from the, the Riverina um, two days ago. And you know, you'd think, well, a dairy farm could be quite threatened by this environment because their footprint's pretty high. Uh, you know, when they complete our orders, you, you can get a figure of 21 tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions per tonne of milk solids. That's, that's a pretty high footprint. Um, and halfway through, one of the producers here said to me, oh, you know, so this, this product 3NOP in a confinement dairy could deliver about a 75% reduction in methane. What did you say the green, the global warming potential was? 28, multiplied by 28. And you told me Mootrail has a method that will recognize 3NOP. And before long, he was saying to me, listen, this is 600 bucks per cow per year that I could get for spending a dollar a day on a cow. Um, and suddenly you see where the smart guys are thinking. You know, he, he quickly figured out from my presentation, forget soil carbon, I'm never, never going to make money there. But if I get one of these inhibitors that's highly effective in a confinement system and I can get it into that cow every day and every mouthful, I could get 600 bucks per cow per day, uh, per, per year of offset income, even just on the voluntary market. Um, and that's before it's the compliance market in Australia, which would be releasing a method for inhibitors coming up soon. So, so I think before we sort of discount the farmer side of the equation, there's some smart guys out there thinking through this and how it, it, it can get through. I, I met with two sort of younger uh, sheep producers from central New South Wales recently who wanted to have a chat to me. And they were recognizing that this idea of building soil carbon and getting paid for it was only rewarding bad farmers because, well, why was your soil carbon low in the first place? Um, and they were saying the, they've got a, a, a they've, they've thought through a mechanism by which farmers who've done the right thing who've got a high level of carbon in their soil and have got good farming systems, low emissions intensity, can get rewarded by the market. Um, now, it's not a carbon credit market, and they, they are just brilliant in what they've come up with and all power to them because what they will do is they will accelerate the good farmers and reward them for what they've already done and then give them incentive to do more rather than just rewarding those bad farmers for coming up to what we might consider standard practice. So before you discount the adoption side of the equation, there's some smart guys out there that are thinking this through very carefully and are finding opportunities in the marketplace. So I hope um, that answers your question. The more, the more you say, the more questions I have. So um, I don't know where this is going to go, but um, that leads to two things. Firstly, um, I'd be really interested to hear um, a bit more about how you're approaching carbon accounting and in terms of making that, um, I guess, operable at a scale that is not, you know, overly um, expensive and time consuming. Um, so if you could give me a bit of a, a insight into that. Sure. Um, so so um, we've we worked in this area for quite a long time and we started out just doing the direct, what the national inventory said about your greenhouse gas footprint and all that. And so some of our early tools were just reflecting that. Um, over time, we've worked with uh, the National Carbon Offset Standard in Australia and the Climate Active, which is now Climate Active, um, and started understanding wh how, what would be the right way to do carbon accounting. So it's kind of an iteration that's gone on. And we've, we've landed at a place where we are consistent with IPCC methodology, but we're also consistent with ISO 14,041, uh, so the LCA uh, approach. Um, so all our carbon tools now, and, and we've written this for Meat and Livestock Australia to say, well, this is what we mean by being carbon neutral. Um, if you want to be carbon neutral or climate neutral, this is the definition. So it then becomes a, 
um, total greenhouse gas emissions emitted from the business unit. So you draw a boundary around the business unit. So if you have two livestock properties that are transferring animals between the two, your business unit is both. Yep. If you're a dairy system that has a, um, a, 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 a an offset block um, where you're raising your, your heifers, well, that includes in the business unit. So, so that's one thing. Um, so then it becomes all the scope one emissions, which is methane and nitrous oxide directly from that business. Um, it then also becomes your scope two, which is electricity you buy out of the grid because you could choose to buy green energy or you could choose to put panels on your roof. So that's scope two. It then includes scope three, which is your upstream emissions. So if you're a dairy farmer buying in grain and you don't buy from a carbon neutral grain supplier, we account for the grain, the embedded emissions in the grain or the urea fertilizer or the phosphorus you bring onto the farm because you have a decision about what you buy. And so it is within the scope of the emissions. You can choose to buy heifers from a carbon neutral supplier. So those pre-farm emissions come into the equation. And then we take all the sinks, the soil carbon change and the tree carbon change within that boundary. And that's the method that determines the net carbon balance of a farm on an annual time step basis. Back to what you were saying about the innovative dairy farmers and people who are, you know, actively looking at how they can, you know, create, um, I guess, greater revenue for their farms. Do you see that changing the, I guess, the, the structure of the farming community over time or, um, or the nature of whether that's, larger farms, different makeups, or having an impact on, on the structure of the farming community? Yeah, look, there's a couple of challenges in there. The, the, the one is um, a lot of the work we've done initially on case studies of farms would suggest that for an average dairy farm in south of southern Australia, a single offset method will generate less than 1% of farm turnover. And that seemed to roll out pretty pretty similar in, in, in most cases. So for a $2 million turnover business of a dairy farm, you know, a, a guy with 600 cows might be a $2 million turnover business. Um, that's $2,000. We, we don't get dairy farmers out of bed for $10,000 of energy savings. So $2,000 is not going to get them excited. Um, but what that means is that we've, if you look at where the offsets have gone, um, a lot of them are, say, in herd methodology which has favored some of the larger corporates because 1% of turnover wouldn't get a dairy farm excited because it's $2,000. But for a large corporate cattle company in Northern Australia, it's $12 million. Um, so numerically, it's a big number. Percentage-wise, it's still 1% of turnover. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so it has, the system has favored the corporates um, in, in engaging in some of these larger offset methods, savannah burning, the herd methodology, for example. Um, we've got to change that somehow. And, and, and where we see a change is that dairy farmer example, where instead of a 20% reduction in methane, we could be talking about 80%. Now, numerically, then that becomes 10% of turnover as an offset me method. The other caveat I'd put in there, though, is that I think we have a limited window to capitalize on offsets. Currently, if you get involved in offsets, you can get your $600 per cow if you've got that supplement. I would say that by 2030, if you look at the Unilever targets, the Wilma Sugar targets, the all, all, the, all the supply chain, Cargill, or, um, uh, all, all those, those multinationals, they start kicking in at about 2030. And that's not rewarding offsets. That's saying there's a market access here. There's a, uh, an expectation. So we have a window between now and 2030 to either capitalize on trading offsets or demonstrating carbon neutrality and accessing premium wool markets like one of our clients has done or accessing premium uh, meat markets in Fed Square re restaurants. Um, that's another case study. So we're seeing farmers access premium markets on carbon neutrality alone without trading offsets, just demonstrating carbon neutrality. But you'd have to say that by 2030, it's, that's going to fade because it will all fall into market expectations. So we, we, we're in this transition phase at the moment. Um, and there's also talk in the scientific community that somewhere between now and 2050, 
offsets, carbon storage offsets, will be reserved only to draw down the atmosphere rather than offset greenhouse gas emissions that should just be eliminated. Um, so so we'll, we'll see the change in emphasis in soil and tree carbon offsets being reserved only for drawdown. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I would put it to you that no business will get away with just using offsets to get to market access. So both, both sides are going to evolve simultaneously, I guess, yeah. essentially yeah. what's going to happen there. Yeah. Um, I guess where, where do you see the, the international stage? You said, you know, you're, you're from Africa, you're doing a lot of research in Africa. The dynamics of farming systems in Africa are quite different to the Western world, North America, Europe, Australia. Um, how do you see um, the tools that have been developed in the West being appropriate for, for those markets or uh, or applicable for those markets yeah no exactly right um you know one of the projects we're involved in in east africa is um what if we treated all the sheep in east africa for worms how much methane would you save and it's actually a massive number um and so you could see a, an early win to be to be gained there because you've got um wealthy countries with philanthropy that would invest in greenhouse gas reduction and animal welfare if the two could be combined. Um, and so you could see a, a, a big rollout of, um, of aid into improving animal health as a result of reducing methane. Because, you know, stomach worms affect permeability in the gut and therefore affect gut flow rate and therefore animals with worm infections can produce a lot more methane than they would otherwise. Um, another way of looking at it that we, we've, we've started, and that's one of the meetings I'm having with one of my PhD students in Nairobi today, um, is doing a, a multifunctional life cycle assessment of some of these systems, because traditionally we've said, well, a dairy system in Victoria is far more efficient than a dairy system in Africa producing three litres of milk above the calf. Um, but and when, you, when you do the analysis in a different way and you say, well, actually, that animal has a multifunctional purpose. In order to be vegetarian in that village, they need that animal to plow the field. Otherwise, they would need a diesel tractor. Yep. So let's attribute some of the green, sorry, there's a multi here. Um, uh, that they need to buy a diesel tractor to plow the field, so the animal is draft power. Let's attribute some of the greenhouse gas emissions to draft power. The next step is, well, that animal is a bank account. The, 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 your symbol of wealth is whether you've got 15 cattle or five cattle. Um, so let's attribute some of that to, to wealth. Now, that's part of the tragedy of the commons in Africa is that 15 skinny cattle are worth more than five fat, healthy animals yeah. because they, don't, they graze on a communal resource, which is why there's so much overgrazing. But that's, that's part of the equation. You could also then say to be vegetarian in that village, you need those animals to be corralled at night and the dung and urine to be collected as fertilizer. Otherwise, you need to buy fossil fuel generated fertilizer to fertilize your field. And there's a great analysis that actually showed that if you take the emissions per liter of milk and you divide it, the emissions between all the multifunctionality as a consequence of not consuming diesel, as a consequence of not consuming fossil fuel fertilizers, the emissions per liter of milk from a dairy cow in East Africa is far lower than the most efficient Californian dairy or the most efficient New um, Australian dairy. So that, actually, um, that's that's um, unsurprising and fascinating. Um, have you have you come across any papers where that's been? Yeah, I can send you a one called "Multifunctional Life Cycle Assessment," published by this group in Nairobi. Um, that sounds that sounds that sounds well worth a read. That is absolutely fascinating because you know it is the draft animal. It is the you know the bank account. Um, yeah. You're providing Same. direct protein to you know. There's no pasteurization. The kids are you know or the families basically drinking the milk pretty much straight out of the cow. Um, so there's so many other and and that whole I guess it's that whole. Um, you know, the wadi agriculture type thing where the animals go and graze the rangelands and bring the nutrients back to the vegetable and the, the okay. gardens. So you're providing all that fertilizer. And, um, you know, I don't know about you, but I spend most of my life in Africa and I don't recall seeing many African children with eczema or asthma or, um, uh, you know, nutritional disorders. Um, <laughs> I think there's a, 
is the cause and effect there of good immune systems from the beginning. Yes. Oh, yeah. No, completely, completely. There's, so that's another whole conversation, I think, down that. So that's a that's another a big rabbit hole that would be another whole conversation. Um, I just one one other thing quickly, and I guess it comes into the unfortunately the politics of all this um, has has become muddied. Um, animals for the history of agriculture have they were the the original recyclers. Um, the you know even if we go back to medieval times the the pigs ate the the way um after the dairy and the the chickens basically cleaned up after the other stock and ate the vegetable scraps from the garden and the pigs ate the food scraps and and they brought in the nutrients from the fields for the garden so they were the original recyclers that we we relied on for millennia um, I guess so. What's your thoughts on on the future of animal agriculture? Yeah, look, it, it, it is is a big subject that, um, and and there've been a a number of publications uh, suggesting that you know how much global warming we could avoid by eliminating ruminant agriculture, and um, I think a lot of those are extremely naive publications. Um, that, just to put it out there right from the beginning, they, they're nice theoretical studies, um, but they have no practical grounding. Why I say that, and I can send you a little piece that I've written on this, um, the, the proportion of the world's population that have the privilege of diet choice is less than about 8% of the world's population. The rest of the world doesn't actually get a choice over what they eat. There's a number of metrics you could use uh, that, you know, one of them is... Um, 16% of the world's population earn over 20 US dollars a day. Um, let's say that that's some cutoff as to whether you do or don't have determination um, over what you eat. Um, you know, most people under that probably just eat what's in front of them. Um, so if you take some of those metrics, and I've got some other indicators of, of the proportion of the world's population, it sort of brings it down to single figures of the world's population that even have the choice over whether they eat ruminants or not. Um, and that then becomes very limited to the most wealthy of the world, which you, you and I know that you, know, you, you and I sit in 1% of the wealthiest people in the world. Let's apply that across and say, well, how does that align with diet change? Most people in Africa don't actually eat the animals on a regular basis. They need them as part of uh, food security and resilience. So if you're in the Sahel region of Africa, you can't survive the frequency of droughts without having livestock to provide milk um, to buffer the crop failures you might get. Um, and so, so in terms of the developing world, which is where most of the livestock are, they are integral to food security. So we, we really don't want to fiddle with that um, because you know, taking away the uh, food security that they currently have would make them just dependent on industrial agriculture sending food into the developing world rather than self-reliance. So, so I think those, those kind of studies, they also ignore um, the mitigation options that are coming through now. So that actually, if you roll out mitigation options, say in the next 20 years that reduce methane by 50%, that's almost better than what the coal industry is going to achieve. Um, so it ignores the potential to do something about it. So I, you know, I, I come back and say, uh, oh, the, the other side of the equation is we, we also know that the world's rising middle class, you've seen the graphs, as you, as you increase in personal affluence in your own GDP, um, your own personal wealth, there's a clear trend for demanding more animal-based protein in the diet. Now, if you follow that through and you, and you say that 4.3 billion people will be added to the rising middle class by 2030, 4.3 billion new people, um, Australia could more than triple its livestock production, its red meat production, and still not meet demand. So the notion that the world's going vegetarian to save the planet is completely, it's not grounded in any form of reality. Um, we're going to have 4.3 billion people all wanting more red meat, uh, or meat generally, rather than just red meat. You know, a lot of it is white meat first and then red meat later. Um, give you an example. The, the, a talk by Riberbank the other day, the fastest two subsectors of growth in livestock demand in the world is the rise of McDonald's in China. So it's the, uh, the red meat required for hamburgers 
in McDonald's in China, and it's the cheese required for, it's the milk required for cheese on hamburgers in China. Um, if you had to sort of boil it down to subsectors. And so, so I, I think it's a nice theoretical exercise to say if we went vegetarian, and there's no doubt that if you an average American eating 45 kilos of red meat in a year, well, your doctor would be happy if you just cut that by half anyway. So moderation of that 8% of the world's population that have choice over their diet might be a good idea from a health point of view, and you might reduce your personal greenhouse gas footprint. Excellent. Um, thank you very much. Is there anything else that you, you think you'd like to add that we haven't, haven't discussed? No, but it's, at some stage, you know, it's probably not in the brief here, but um, there is a lot of misguided enthusiasm around soil carbon, and I suspect that the... Um, the politicians have been captured by this notion that the soils can save the world and allow us to continue to use fossil fuels. Um, and to put it in high level summary, soil carbon in Australia is 80% leveraged on rainfall, 80% correlated with rainfall. And we have 22% more rainfall variability than any other country in the world. It's plain Russian roulette to say soil carbon can save anything other than itself. So enough said <laughs> okay well thank you for that that's um i guess it's like most silver bullets um there's 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 um uh, they're not as common as um as people would like them to be yeah but but you know i i i, I used to think there wouldn't be silver bullets for methane but i am seeing that some of these new products coming through are actually doing real reductions of methane that are sustained over long periods um, and so, so I'm, I'm quite hopeful in that area because there's a fundamental difference between a soil carbon credit, which is a finite bank account, and a methane reduction credit, which is can, can happen every day and you don't have to spend 100 years looking after it, if, if that makes sense. The methane emission, if you reduce methane by 50%, that didn't happen. That methane never got to the atmosphere in that day. Yeah, You can be confident in trading that on a voluntary market or a compliance market. Soil carbon credit is fundamentally different and just dramatically higher risk because it's a finite resource. And if you monetize it, well, it could be gone tomorrow because of a drought. Yeah, or you, or you, someone, you sell the paddock and someone else goes and, and sticks a plow through it for a couple of years. And, and it's gone. And it's so gone. there's a fundamental difference in the security markets are going to have in the future in buying methane reduction credits versus sequestration credits. Just because climate has a big role in how sequestration credits are looked after in the future. Yeah. Uh, we, we've done an analysis that in South, Southeast Australia, you'd be lucky to hang on to your soil carbon that you have today in a future climate because of declining growing season rainfall. So, you know. I guess going back to the rainfall, the drought side of things, the last thing you, a farmer wants in a drought is having to, to pay back the creditors for his soil carbon as he's, or he or she is, is looking at buying feed for their animals and all those other expenses. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of warnings out there at the moment. It's too many farmers being signed up to soil carbon credit projects that I think are just not aware of the risk that they're facing. Where do you see what you think um, should be done or could be done in terms of raising awareness about that side of things? Well, I think I think we've got it. I mean, I'm 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 on the road. This is you know, I'm I'm doing five talks this week alone on on this subject from the sort of poultry industry on Monday, the viticulture industry on Tuesday, the grains industry on Wednesday, just trying to warn people that you know there's a big difference between something like an emission reduction credit, which if you're required to be carbon neutral by 2040 or 2030, you can sell those emission reduction credits every day up until 2030 when you're required to be carbon neutral and you just stop selling them and you keep the reduction for yourself as part of your compliance. Yep. Soil and tree carbon, if you keep selling it out of a finite resource, it's gone. It's left your farm, it's left your business, it's left your industry because you sold it to a power station or you sold it to a software company. You will never have that back again to be part of your carbon balance by 2030. So there's a major risk on um, the fact that drought can erode it, but also, and then you have to pay it back, and that it's a finite resource rather than methane reduction being a far more secure resource 
also secure for the buyer because if it didn't happen, the buyer has security. It didn't happen. Yeah, you know? no, that makes perfect sense. That makes that makes complete yeah. sense. And the market hasn't wised up that they should be paying more for methane reduction credits than soil carbon credits. Thank you very, very much. Pleasure to talk to you. Thanks, Anne.